All right. Uh, well, thanks for joining everybody. Uh, this is we're going to be going over teams administration and governance. Um, again, my name is Stephen Rhodes. I, I just did a not again, but I was in a session earlier with uh, uh, Michael Helfrich over on the security side. I've been in IT for about 20 years. I uh, started my career in the bowling business and Rohana was actually the first person to hire me into IT. So I've been working with Microsoft top technologies doing uh, application development uh, and uh, intranets and uh, other kinds of uh, technologies as well as project management. Um, and with Synergy, I've been managing a lot of our global projects. Also, uh, I manage projects with our smaller clients as well. Uh, but I've done a lot of SharePoint, OneDrive, and uh, Windows deployments. Uh, I also conduct a number of teams in Office 365 boot camps. So I'm very familiar with the productivity features. Um, today, we're going to be talking about, like we said, administration and governance. And one thing that uh, David talked about in the keynote is that this conference is about productivity and security. So we talk about governance, we're going to be talking about kind of the intersection of those two things. Um, he mentioned that the CIO cares about security, but the CEO cares about productivity, and there doesn't need to be a trade-off between those two. So hopefully one of the things you're going to get coming out of this are some of the features around teams that you're going to want to be aware of uh, to kind of strike that balance. So we're going to start out Kind of talking and level setting uh, what Teams is for those of you that are not familiar with it, the technologies that it leverages, some of the basic concepts for administering Teams. We're not going to get too deep into, into all of this but um, or, or on the side of a team owner, but we're really going to take the perspective from a Teams admin. And then we're really going to focus our time on the governance and making sure that you leave here understanding the key settings and policies that you're going to want to consider uh, as you start to roll out teams. So we have 45 minutes, um, or rather about 50 minutes. Uh, I'm going to pause at certain points for questions. And uh, yeah, let's get rolling. So what is Teams? Microsoft calls Teams its hub for teamwork. It's a single collaboration uh, tool that incorporates uh, chat meeting and meetings and calls. Uh, it has the collaborative capabilities of Office 365 with deep integrations to things like Word, Excel, and uh, PowerPoint uh, applications that you're used to using. And it's highly customizable and extensible. So you can have access to a lot of third-party apps within Teams very easily, and you can also customize your own line of business applications. Uh, it's built on the, uh, the Microsoft 365 platform and that provides a lot of robust security compliance and administrative tooling and and we'll talk on these today uh, just to level set on what teams is uh, built on so you have your teams clients these are the desktop mobile apps uh, and the browsers that you're accessing the team service through it leverages the office 365 services such as office 365 groups uh, which Nikki talked a lot about in the previous session, uh, SharePoint, OneDrive, and Exchange Online. So we'll, we'll see some more about this in a second. And the team services are the component that really delivers those core collaboration and communication features. It also uses the Skype for Business online infrastructure uh, for hybrid use cases and integrating to that older service. And then it's all built on the Azure platform. So it uses its infrastructure for storage and compute. Uh, and then being on this platform, it allows us to leverage these, the Microsoft 365 and Azure AD administration tooling uh, that allows us to control identity, uh, groups and licensing, do things like uh, access audit logs. But really the majority of your work on policies is gonna be within the team's administration setting. And this is our center. And this is where you're gonna be managing uh, both your settings as well as the life cycle for teams. Uh, we also on this infrastructure have access to the security and compliance administrative tools. We're not going to get into these too much today, but we will reference how uh, teams can make use of a lot of these capabilities since it's on this platform. So we will talk about uh, those kinds of features. So for example, we have access to things like DLP, 
so that we can uh, prevent sharing sensitive information inside of our teams, channel chats, things like credit card numbers, social security numbers. Uh, audit logs allow us to respond to data discovery requests or investigations. And then e-discovery capabilities allow us to do legal holds and uh, apply retention policies. Uh, so this diagram shows the, sort of the data flow that of how Teams uh, Teams data gets into Exchange and SharePoint Online. So uh, your your Teams chat and channel messages they go through a chat service, hit it, hit an Office 365 substrate in Azure, and they actually end up in Exchange Online. So one on one and group chat messages end up in the end users mailbox, and then channel messages and Teams go into the Teams group mailbox. On the file side, these go directly into SharePoint. So your Teams files are going into SharePoint and your users files are going into OneDrive. Uh, so it's it's these, the fact that we're leveraging Exchange Online and SharePoint Online uh, gives us access to the security and compliance tooling uh, and information discovery tools like, or protection tools like eDiscovery, legal holds and retention policies. So for example, if you wanted to place a legal hold on your uh, your private chats in Teams, you would do that on the user's mailbox. If you wanted to hold channel chats, you would do that on the group mailbox and any Teams content for the files or wiki, uh, you would put the, the SharePoint site underpinning the team uh, on hold. And then again, your private chat files, when, you, when users are sharing files in Teams, they're actually ending up in their OneDrive site. So that's that's where you would place that hold. So just kind of want to give some background on where the data is landing. Uh, here's a few, a little bit of more, more information on where the data is resting. So again, your chats are, are going through uh, table storage in Azure, ultimately getting ingested into Exchange. Things like your images are leveraging uh, blob storages on Azure and ending up also in Exchange. We mentioned the files going to SharePoint and OneDrive. Voicemails are being stored in Exchange. Uh, your recordings are leveraging Azure, but ultimately they, they get encoded and placed into Stream, where you can then share them uh, within your organization. Uh, and then your contacts obviously are in Exchange, and telemetry is using the Microsoft Data Warehouse. There's also this notion of the compliance boundary. So this diagram shows us where that is. So the compliance boundary is uh, is where Microsoft can actually manage the data or your data. Uh, and the security and privacy around it. And this shows how there's both two-way, there's two-way communications between things like your the end user clients, the browsers and the desktops, uh, guests accessing it, anonymous users joining the meeting like we have today, uh, as well as any federation. And then there are connectors uh, and bots that actually post, post uh, messages into Teams uh, and then there are also outbound data services, things like in the black boxes, such as Giphy's third, par third party file storage, such as uh, Dropbox, Google Drive, ShareFile. Those are uh, third party services that, that you cannot control. Uh, so those are things where you may want to think about, uh, do you need to disable these or consider, consider, consider their use for compliance reasons? So before we uh, move on, are there any questions at this point? I don't see any in the chat, but if there's anyone that wants to come off a of mute to ask anything. Okay. We'll jump into the Teams administration, some concepts we want to level set on. So there are three types of Teams. There are public Teams that anyone can find and join. There are private Teams. These are ones that have an owner that manages it. They will add members uh, or members or people will request access to it. Private teams, uh, they can also be discoverable so people can search and find them, but we'll show you today some settings you can use to con control that. Org-wide teams are ones where you have a use case where you may want to include all members of your company in a team and have them automatically added as they come and go from your active directory. Uh, these do not include accounts like your guest users or any service room or equipment accounts. Um, so those are the three types of teams that you have. A recent feature that came out in the fall are private channels. Uh, private channels give you a secure work area, kind of a subset 
of uh, secure work that uh, that uh, a subset of team members inside of that team can do some more private work. This is a great feature that allows you to reduce the number of teams that you create. Uh, members can create these, but you can control that. Uh, guests cannot. And the team owners, a team owner has to actually be added to the private channel for them to see the content. Uh, a team owner will know that the, the, this private channel is there and see the name and actually be able to delete it but they can't see the content unless that private channel is, um, they're added to it. So really private channels make it possible now for you to structure your teams in, in more of an organizational or departmental manner before private teams. That subset of users, if you had three people, let's say in the leadership uh, team that needed to uh, work collectively and they were within one department or one side of the organization, you had to spin up a separate team for it. So really private channels are important to understand because it really does give you that flexibility to be able to uh, structure your teams kind of by department or, or functions that way. Uh, underpinning all of, all of this, when you create a team, you're actually creating a SharePoint site collection. And so as you create channels and add channels, you're adding those, they're getting added as file folders inside of the shared documents default library in uh, in the site collection. So here's an example. It shows you the general channel. Channels one and two are actually folders. Uh, I believe Nikki may have mentioned that you don't want to mess with these, rename them or delete them, and you really don't want to actually be uh, placing files at the root of the SharePoint site as well. Teams is really meant to kind of take away uh, and demystify or, or simplify your access to files and folders and collaboration. So even though SharePoint is under the covers and you'll see open in SharePoint, um, it's actually meant so that users don't even have to think about it and you don't have to worry about managing the file structures or the permissions, it just works. Uh, OneDrive for Business is where your chat files are stored. So as a user shares a file individually with people or a group of people, they're gonna get stored in that user's OneDrive for Business. A few, uh, of the roles available, there's the team service administrator. They have access to all the settings. They manage the policies and the life cycle for uh, basically Office 365 groups that underpin a team. Uh, there are other roles. These are typically for organizations that are using calling features and need, need more capabilities around supporting those. So you have the team's communication administrator that manages calling and meeting features as well as the support engineer and support specialist roles where they're actually able to uh, support any issues around uh, calls and they have different access to levels of data. So uh, if you need those roles, they're available. You're using the calling features. The core management tools that we'll talk about are and that we will be talking about today is the Microsoft Teams Admin Center. Uh, this is where you're going to be uh, basically managing the, um, the the features or the policies around meetings, messaging, and calls. This is also where you'll manage the life cycle of a team. Uh, you can create, create teams, archive them, delete them, add users, add channels within the team's admin center. Uh, and then for users, this is where you'll add policy assignments, uh, do things like adjust the audio conferencing, uh, or upgrade users if you're moving from Skype for Business to Teams. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty of how you access these. We're really going to focus today more on the policies so that you can understand some of these settings. Uh, but really, it's this Teams Admin Center where you can do most of your, your work. There's also the Microsoft Security Center and the Microsoft 365 Compliance Center, where a lot of the security and compliance tools uh, are available. This is where you do things like set retention policies uh, and do e-discovery. And then Azure Active Directory, the, the admin center is where any group management or identity or licensing would be done. So if you needed to adjust a group naming policy, you'll see, for example, that that's done within the uh, Azure AD uh, admin center. Uh, you can, there are PowerShell modules that allow you to script things like policy assignments or manage the life cycle of teams. We're not going to get into the details of this, but you can do things like create teams and channels, assign users. Uh, there's a Teams PowerShell module uh, for team management. Uh, you're actually using the Skype for Business PowerShell module for user policies. 
And uh, you also can uh, use the Graph API, and this is a way for you to automate things like the creation of teams based on business processes and use uh, and also tap into tools like Power Automate, previously known as Flow. We do, uh, we do a process such as this at Synergy where when a contract is signed, gets to a certain status in our CRM, we automatically create a team for a project and then the, uh, the delivery team will use that team uh, and invite guests and, uh, and so forth. So, We've seen this process work. It's a great way for you to automate uh, with some of these more modern tools. Any questions at this point? All right, let's jump into some of the governance and best practices. So Microsoft recommends that you take kind of a three phase approach as you're adopting teams. You want to start in the start phase uh, where you're actually assessing your environment. This is where you would assemble your, your team of stakeholders and administrators and go through the education and readiness process. It's that next phase, the experiment phase, is where you wanna begin establishing and refining your governance. And this is, you're gonna wanna be doing this as you're piloting teams. So this is where you'll define your use cases, build your rollout and adoption plan, uh, and then you want to do this governance before you move to that scale phase where you're doing your actual rollout and training and driving adoption. So it's really this experiment phase where the things that we're talking about today, you're going to want to be making those decisions at that time. As a part of your start phase, one of the key things you want to do is assess and validate your network readiness. Uh, we've got some links here to some tools you can use to uh, understand the network requirements. You need to make sure uh, that your bandwidth uh, will support it and that you have things like your Office 365 IPs and ports, uh, that those are whitelisted. Um, and then you also want to make sure that your, your network meets the requirements for real-time voice audio and communications. We're not going to get into the details here, but I would like to call this out because it's very important. If you, if you run into any performance issues in Teams, they'll typically surface as audio or video problems. Um, but this is where, you know, you're networking. You really do want to do an assessment of that. Make sure that, uh, that it's supporting teams and, and structured properly. There is a tool inside of the Teams Admin Center called the Network Planner. This allows you to basically uh, define your sites and plug in the bandwidth that you have available to them and then set personas for the types of usage that you typically you expect to have based on the different teams workloads. Uh, and then once you do this, it'll spit out a report on, on your bandwidth expectations or the kind of usage that it'll see. And if you have any, any problems, it'll, it'll uh, potentially point these out. We just like to call out that this is really, it's just a, a kind of a best guess based on typical scenarios. So it's not actually leveraging any of your real data. It's just the data that you're putting in. So it's really kind of an estimation thing about the kind of bandwidth that you might need and if, do you need to upgrade a site, for example. Uh, there's a tutorial link here available if you want to walk through how that works. Uh, we definitely advise you looking at this from uh, as you are in that start phase. There's also a preview feature called the Teams Advisor under the planning section. Uh, this is, it actually creates a team and it creates a channel for a couple of the workloads, the chat, Teams, channels, and apps workload, as well as the uh, meetings and conferencing. And when you do that, this, it creates, uh, creates a, a channel and it actually adds a planner board and some other uh, resources. But that planner board, and here's some screenshots of it, it actually goes through the detailed steps in the different phases and the tasks that you want to do uh, to, to kind of roll out teams. This is a great resource. It includes uh, checklists. It includes links to documentation. It has a, it does a tenant assessment to find things, uh, the common configurations that you're going to want to update or modify. Definitely advise uh, looking at this. And this is meant to include your full adoption team. So it's not just the administrator, even though you create this in the admin center. It's meant for you to, to work with your stakeholders and pilot users as you're starting to do that, uh, that experiment phase. So why do we do governance? Uh, typical concerns are uh, getting too many teams, having a pro proliferation of them or duplicate 
teams and data or a poor structure. Um, you may be concerned about uh, loss of sensitive data or intellectual property. And so those are things you may want to look at your compliance and security features that you can apply. Uh, you want to make sure that people aren't accessing uh, from outside the org things that they shouldn't or that the people inside of your organization are able to access the things that they should. Um, and then any performance issues that could impact your users because of these settings to their productivity. So when we're talking about governing teams, there are three general areas that we're concerned about. It's the global configurations. These are the things that apply org-wide to all of your teams. There are the user-based policies that we set for the users and then the overall lifecycle management. So the creation, the monitoring, the sunsetting of teams, those are the things we want to think about. Microsoft has uh, this quick start guide where they kind of walk through the top thing, the top items that you really want to consider as you're rolling out teams. So for example, do we, do we uh, who, who, who do we allow to create teams and, and by nature Office 365 groups? Do we need to look at things like creating naming policies for our teams? Are we, are we concerned about any of the meeting features? So we'll look at those today. Uh, do we need to lock any of those down? Are we using and allowing guest access and do we need to modify that at, at, at a global level or with individual teams? And then do we need to lock down any apps or third party apps? And then again, all those security features around data, uh, do we need to do things like enable DLP or do we want to uh, enable MFA, for example, for our guest users? So again, uh, these are things that would be done during that experiment phase. This is kind of another view to governance and it includes some of those things that we talked about, uh, but you also want to consider things like, do we need to set expiration policies for groups, uh, set retention or DLP? Do we need to uh, create teams templates? Uh, and do we have a process for that? And then uh, as we're monitoring, these are kind of the, the, the sets of admin tools that you would use to then uh, perform that. So one key concept to understand is this model uh, for the configurations and policies. So policies are, are built, uh, they start with a, a default global policy. These are the recommended settings that are uh, by default applied to all users, but you can can customize, create custom policies, and assign those to individual groups of users. So policies then are user-based. Configurations are your settings that would apply across the across all teams. Uh, so you would have a single setting for these, uh, and and all users would then be impacted by, by this. So for example, uh, an example of uh, policies would be the meeting policies. Uh, these would be things like content sharing and meetings. Uh, and then an example of a configuration would be meeting settings, which is something like uh, the ability for anonymous users to join meetings. So we'll see those in our examples today. So the first key decision that you, you want to consider is uh, who can create teams. So by default, anyone can create an Office 365 group and therefore a team. Many organizations choose to restrict this. You need to do this through PowerShell to lock it down to a select group of users or security group. Uh, if you do this though, you need to consider what's our process to request a team to be created. So Teams is meant, uh, it's open by default because it's meant to allow for organic growth. So some organizations like to let people kind of spin up their own teams and uh, create them as they need to. But if you do that, you need to make sure that you understand how are you managing the life cycle of those teams? Is there somebody monitoring those? Are they uh, making sure that they're archiving them um, or and so forth? It is very common though for or large organizations uh, to lock down the creation of groups and then create a process. So this is one of the, the first things you want to think about. Another thing you can do is you can create a naming policy for your teams. Uh, so, for example, if you wanted to add a prefix or suffix before someone entered the name of that team, you can do that based on some internal attributes or a fixed string. You can also block, use blocked words. So, if, for example, if you didn't want anybody creating a team with the name human resources, you can upload a list of block words uh, over here in this other tab. Um, this is mostly though, if you're having people create their own teams, if you, for example, lock it down, you can certainly control the naming because you're creating those teams yourself. 
this requires an Azure AD premium license and admin accounts would be excluded for this. So an admin could still create a team uh, or a group and, and give it whatever name they need to. Uh, one of the other key considerations you need to look at are under org wide settings and that's external access. So external access is the ability for you to communicate uh, with other organizations and other domains with Teams and Skype for Business. Uh, this is something where it's open by default. So um, that basically allows anyone to contact you. Uh, you can lock this down to allow only certain domains or you can go the other way and block specific domains. It's very common for organizations to turn this on and just say we're federated uh, with, let's say, uh, you know, these business partners or groups. So I believe uh, Synergy, we're doing this with a number of our clients. Um, but this has to be set properly in both your, your tenant as well as the one that you're trying to set Federation up. So external access is really where you're doing the chats and the calls and scheduling meetings. Uh, this does not give people the ability to search for teams. That's called guest access. And so guest access is off by default. It's also find, found under the org wide settings. So this uh, over here, allow guest access and teams would be toggled off once you once you toggle it on, there are a number of different settings available uh, for your guest users. Um, so things like making calls or using video or the screen sharing mode, for example, you may want to limit the ability for uh, guests to, to share their screen in meetings. Also the ability for them to edit or delete messages. This is something we actually have set, set at Synergy where our guests can't edit or delete their messages. Um, you, you also can turn off chat or any of the more collaborative features or fun features like Giphy's or memes or stickers. Um, so guests, when you, uh, when you add a guest to a team, understand that what, they are, what you're doing is you're giving them access just to the content and the conversations within that team. So they cannot search for other teams. They have to be added to those. Uh, they also can't do things like uh, attach fi files to chats. Uh, they can't create a team. They can't uh, upload upload file or they can upload files to the team. But the point is their access is restricted to the team to which you've assigned them. They're not going to be able to go into your org and see all your other teams. You would have to individually add them to those other teams. Um, so we showed how this allow guest access in teams. It's just that toggle that you need to toggle it to, to get it to work. But if you're using guest access, uh, we advise you look at this guest access checklist because there are a number, multiple other settings within uh, Office 365 groups um, that have to be checked. All of these are, are basically on by default unless you have made any changes yourself to these. So these are things that could impact your ability for users to do things like share files inside of a team. Remember. SharePoint is underneath Teams, so if you were to turn off the ability for you to share files with guests uh, and only in your organization, for example, in SharePoint, then when people are trying to uh, add a file to a team, th they're going to have problems with that. So again, we advise you look at this. Uh, you can do things within Azure AD like control if members can invite uh, or if guests can also invite other guests. So this is all something you might want to turn off. So definitely look at the guest access features and check out this checklist and make sure you understand all of the underpinning settings that you need to care about. Uh, so the first settings with about teams are under org wide settings. Uh, it's one of the key features is the ability to email the channel. So you may want to turn this off or you can also uh, restrict it to certain domains. You can also do things like turn off the ability for at mentions so that only team owners can do that or, or uh, to tag people with at mentions or you can uh, restrict it or allow it for owners and members or disable it completely. Um, you also, one of the key settings that a lot of organizations care about is are these files, these third party services. So things like uh, Dropbox, Google Drive, you most likely don't want people storing files in there uh, or, or collaborating through those services unless it's something organizationally that you accept. Uh, so this is where under the team settings where you can restrict that, turn those off. There's also a setting 
for organizational tabs. So I think this was demoed earlier um, by Bob or April, where in an individual chat, you can see uh, the org structure and where somebody that you're chatting with fits within the uh, company's organization. Some people like to turn this off if they don't have that data set up properly, um, but that's also available under the team settings. So the first policy, these are things, again, policies are assigned at the user level. First example of this is a Teams policy. Here's an example of the global default policy, which actually allows uh, for Teams, private Teams to be discoverable. So people can search for the private team and then request to be added to it. Again, that doesn't let them join the team. They're, they're putting in a request to the owner to be added, but it does mean that they would be able to find out that a private team exists. So if you don't want private teams to be discoverable that way, you can turn that off uh, and assign that or either turn it off globally or create a policy for individual users. And then private channels. You, you, there may be cases where you don't want users creating private channels and you can toggle that off. So this is the first example of a policy. Uh, under meetings, uh, under the meet, meeting settings, uh, the really big one you want to care about, you, may, you want to look at is anonymous users. So. I uh, believe we have a lot of uh, we have anonymous users joining meetings. So basically, this is where you want to be able to create a, a Teams meeting and just send it out via email to anybody, not have to worry about them having a guest account or any other kind of federation with your tenant. Uh, this is really what enables that. So you have to turn this on um, for that to work. You can also do things like uh, set a custom email invitation and put your logo or legal or help URLs within that. Those have to be hosted on a public website for that to work. Uh, but these are some meeting settings you're going to look at. And then meeting policies are a number of key settings here, such as uh, Meet Now. We're only showing a few of these here, uh, but you may want to turn off inside of meetings whether transcription is allowed or, or recording. Uh, you could turn off video if for some reason you did not want people using video in your meetings. And then the screen sharing mode. So this for a lot of organizations, they want to restrict uh, to make sure so that only only a single app can be shared at a time. There may be some concerns about you allowing somebody to uh, share their entire screen and then inadvertently have some data show up that's sensitive uh, that they shouldn't. Or you can disable this entirely. And remember, these are policies, so they could be assigned. You could set the global policy one way and create another policy for a subset of users with this with a different setting and let them use that. Uh, so screen sharing. Also allowing participant control or external participant control in meetings. Uh, that's something that, that you may want to look at. So take a look at the meeting policies and consider these. Uh, so continuing with meeting policies. Uh, you may not want anonymous users to start a meeting. So this is, I believe this is off by default. Uh, and this is so that you have to actually start the Teams meeting before it, the meeting itself will start. Um, you also can set this uh, automatically admit people setting. This is basically the lobby. Um, if you wanted to change this, and I think we have this at Synergy set, so it's our org. Well, no, I think it's it's just our organization, but you can set this so everyone would automatically be admitted. Um, this means that uh, they basically don't go into the lobby. Or you can set it so some some organization that you're federated with uh, that both you and they can start or automatically get admitted into meetings. Um, and then dial in users. These are for people using the phone and uh, that conference audio conference number. Uh, if you uh, if you turn this on, then you don't have to admit them. Um, and then allowing meet now in private meetings, you can turn that off uh, as well as live captions and chat. So live events, these are uh, basically replacing Skype for Business broadcast. Uh, you can have up to 10,000 10, people in a, in a meeting, and this allows you to have that kind of uh, the presenter role and then audience members who are basically just consuming the content. They're not going to be able to, to um, kind of interrupt the meeting. So Teams meetings are restricted to 250 people. Uh, some organizations don't, don't want just anybody to be able to do this, so they may turn this off the global level and create a custom policy so that maybe just the communications team can set live events. Uh, but there are a number of settings in here, not just the scheduling, but transcription. You can turn that on or off. 
Um, you can define who can even join a live event. So if you want it open to the public, you would set that to everyone. Um, if you just wanted them to be for your company, you could set it to everyone in the org. Or if when you create a live event, uh, you want it to be restricted to the people invited, then that would be the specific users and groups. You also can set the recording, uh, whether that's they're always recorded or never recorded, or if the organizer is the only one that can record it. So live events are something that you're going to look at. Uh, the other key setting under that's an org-wide setting is your uh, the manage apps. So if you want to allow third-party apps, uh, you would set those here under manage apps. And then once you do that, you can actually define sp for specific applications whether they're allowed or blocked. Uh, you can also view here what uh, the, their Microsoft 365 certification status is. Um, and, and this will tell you kind of uh, what that service is, how their what their policies for data governance are. Um, and you can understand a little bit more about those third party services and whether you want to allow them. Uh, you can also upload new apps if you have custom apps that you wanted to use in your tenant here. From the policy side, uh, there are there are user policies you can set that will uh, allow you to um, basically control Microsoft apps. These are called also first party apps, third party apps, and then tenant apps would be anything uh, custom that, that you would have uh, uploaded or allow users to install. There are a number of ways that you can adjust these and each one of these has the ability to either allow all, block all, or allow a specific or block a specific. So for example, here under this third party app section, uh, we've allowed the Adobe Creative Cloud, and this uh, may be a policy that we would then selectively assign to the users that we know have licenses for Adobe Creative Cloud. Uh, just to understand these third party apps, you still have to have um, access to the subscription services if they are those types of services and not free. Um, but again, app policies are an important setting that you want to look at. And then messaging policies. So there's a lot of different uh, policies around or settings around the, the messaging features. Uh, these are basically when you're inside a team channel having conversations. So you can set whether an owner can delete a message that's posted. You can also set whether members can edit and delete their messages. Uh, if you do this, it would apply to every team as you create them, or I'm sorry, or rather, um, if the, the one thing that we note is that it's very frustrating if you turn off things like editing messages or, or not or not being able to delete messages for users. Um, it creates a usability issue. I, for one, am a terrible typer. Uh, I will end up, uh, I, I would really struggle if I was not able to edit my messages. Um, but you may want to consider things like using retention policies if you're concerned about people deleting data and not having a record of that. Uh, you could put these things on legal hold and that would make sure that they were uh, covered. You also may want to control uh, things like read receipts or the, kit, the Giphy service rating. Uh, you could turn off chat entirely here and then some of these other uh, fun features like memes and stickers. Uh, the URL previews, if you didn't want to allow that or you didn't want translating of messages allowed, you could do that. There's also a setting to allow people to remove users from a chat. So if you have a group chat with multiple people uh, and someone wants to be able to remove someone from that, that's what that setting would do. So the messaging policies are another area that you want to look at. So Microsoft rep recommends that you start with the defaults, but that's not going to work for every organization. So here we have an example of um, kind of three different stances that, that uh, companies are, would, might take. Company A is highly regulated, and so they're going to disable a lot of features. They're going to only allow external access to uh, certain domains. They've disabled guest access and anonymous users joining meetings. Uh, they've disabled recording in meetings. They've disabled screen sharing, as well as all, all the third-party storage. Uh, but they do uh, have allowed users to edit and delete their messages. So that would be a highly regulated organization. In a, in a more balanced one where they're they're kind of balancing between security and collaboration, uh, they may block certain domains but allow federation with all others uh, and then enable things like guest access and anonymous users in meetings. But here's an example of how 
you can have this enabled, like meeting recordings could be enabled globally, but then you could say for our HR users, we're going to set a policy and assign it to them. We're going to disable this feature and then set that and assign those policies to those HR users. Um, so just an example here, uh, if you're a more open a company that's open to collaboration, you want to encourage that. You, you might enable all these and even allow access to some services that you might be sharing with uh, some other uh, partners uh, to share files. But really, this is just showing you how, based on your scenarios, you there's a lot of flexibility and these are um, these are capabilities where you can control uh, access to data and settings and policies. So for ongoing lifecycle management, uh, the owners of teams are going to be doing a lot of the management of the teams. So that's by design where they will add, add and remove members. Uh, they're going to manage the team settings for that team themselves. They can also delete the team and then restore it through Office 365 groups. On the Teams admin side, that's where you're going to monitor the activity of Teams. So those reports uh, we'll look at in a second. You can also manage and add and remove users for the owner. Uh, you can add channels. Uh, you can also archive and delete a team. So if you archive a team, it basically locks down the posting of messages, kind of keeps it in a read-only state. Um, there may be a case where you wanted to keep the content, not delete it. Uh, but you want it to kind of be left as a record. So you can archive that way. But those are things that the Teams admin would do. Uh, the Teams admin may also be automating some of this through PowerShell or Graph API. And then the administrator and the stakeholders will, will maybe adjusting policies uh, as you're working through and, and expanding your use of Teams. So uh, as an ongoing thing, it's something you want to look at your, your governance around these policies. If you're an organization using calling features, you may have support roles that are uh, looking at call analytics and uh, and troubleshooting issues there. Even we so, talked about uh, uh, encyclopedias, encyclopedias this morning. This I feel like the like slide deck is the encyclopedia deck of deck team settings. Yeah, there's a I'm ton have to in make here. Sure to download this afterwards. Yeah. Hey, we did have we're at quarter to the hour, and we have a couple questions specifically from York. It looks like one was around oh. the network requirements. Great. York, do you want to jump hey, off? Guys, I think speaker, hey, I think someone yeah, speaker is um, as carrying and getting like multiple. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm hearing some background noise, but can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, good. Thanks. So, Stephen, just uh, you were talking about network assessments and being ready. Can, can I can I assume that if we've done the Skype assessment, that we're probably okay, and we're okay there, that we're probably okay for Teams. Or no. teams introduce any new bandwidth requirements? It, it, uh, it, there's different there are new use cases, York, and you want to consider because it's it's uh, there's more robust features for collaboration and meetings. Uh, you definitely want to look at that from a team's perspective. There's also certain endpoints for teams that you need to whitelist. So you definitely want to go through that, not just. Okay. And then second question on you had the uh, recommended policy settings. Uh, I think it was back a slide for highly reg regulated. Uh, you, you had, yeah, there. The yeah, top, let the me top row. before York. These are not the recommended settings. These are just examples. Ah, okay. Okay. So allow certain domains. I was this curious is, about this, versus yeah. blocking. Yeah, exactly. Domains. These are just examples exactly. of how the they can change and, and be different for a company. We're definitely not saying this is what's recommended. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? It's almost like someone has a bird or something. <laughs> yeah, it was when I came off mute, so it may have been on my end, but it seems okay. to be gone now. All right. Uh, so there's some reporting under uh, the Teams dashboard. When you come into that, there's there's access to some of these these analytic reports that are actually underneath analytics and reports. So you can do things like look at teams, uh, team and channel activity, the user chat and call activity, as well as what types of devices are accessing teams, and then live events. Um, there are also reports under Microsoft usage reports inside of M365. Uh, and there are some capabilities or there's like an adoption pack that you can load up that'll give you uh, some more advanced re reporting analytics around the different workloads in Office 365. Um, and you can see uh, it kind of leverages Power BI 
and lets you see kind of adoption. So we don't go into that, but it is something that you'll want to look at from the M6, M365 usage reports. You can also use Azure AD or yeah, Azure AD to review audit logs if you're concerned about things like guest access. And then you can use advanced uh, premium features in, in uh, Azure AD, such as guest access reviews. This would be something, it's like setting up a process where you're ask, asking a group or team owner to confirm or a guest rather to confirm, do they still need access to this team? Sends them a message. You can get those inputs and then apply uh, apply changes to your 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 um, permissions at that point. So it's not automated, but it really is a way for you to kind of send out notice to people that are have access to Teams and say, um, just double checking, do you need this? Retention policies. Uh, these can be set for channel and chat messages as well as team files. Uh, some of the use cases here, you can retain Teams chat and channel messages for a set duration and then do nothing, or you can retain them and for that specified duration and then delete them. You can set retention policies for as little as one day. Uh, we actually have a client that that uh, considered doing this for some sensitive interactions that they're having uh, with their clients where uh, it's sensitive um, health data where they're using Teams in a, in a channel, but they want to then be able to delete those every day at the end of the day. So this is not the way Teams is meant to be used. Teams is meant to be, uh, as you've seen in the demos earlier today, it's meant for collaboration. It's meant for open uh, view to history so that people can be joining a team later after the fact and get up to speed on what's happening. So it's against the spirit of how the tool should be used, but it can be done. Um, and again, you would apply retention policies on the SharePoint site if you wanted to if you wanted to control or retain your Teams files and then on OneDrive uh, for your chat files. So just understand that the data within Teams, you can apply these retention policies. And then sensitivity labels. Uh, this is a way for you to basically apply labels and policies to groups and regulate that content in Teams. These are set up in the Security and Compliance Center. So for example, in the screenshot here, we have a sensitivity label for confidential. And what this does is it would be, uh, would be force that when you're creating this team that it has to be a private team if you use that label. Uh, and then if you use the general label, you would have access to public and org wide um, teams. So sensitivity labels, these are different from classification labels, which really require to use PowerShell or some other process to take a classification label and uh, have some policy behind it. Uh, so these are. This is a preview feature. Requires, I believe, an E5 license, but you could use these if you wanted to kind of control the creation of teams and place uh, labels on them. You can use group expiration policies. We mentioned this uh, as a capability earlier, but if you wanted uh, to expire all of your groups after a certain period of time, you can do that. Uh, this is uh, can be applied to all groups or to select groups, and you can set the expiration uh, by a number of days. The user would get a notice every 30, 15, or one day before that expiration period happens, and then after a, a, after a day, it would then be deleted. Uh, these There's no way, I believe, to recover them. Um, but yeah, so be careful if you're using group expiration. I don't think you can archive them. I think you can delete them. So this is one of the limitations on uh, group expiration. Um, it does require Azure AD premium licenses. And then external sharing. So as we said before, uh, Teams has SharePoint online under the covers. It's really driving the content. Um, there are org-wide content sharing settings that you need to look at to make sure that these are not uh, that these are not impacting your ability to to share files in Teams or that they're set the way that you want them to. Um, you can limit external sharing, for example, to certain domains. Uh, you can make sure the guests can't share items that they don't own. Uh, there's multiple options here. We're not going to go through all of them, um, but you're definitely going to look at your external sharing settings because they can impact uh, your usage. So kind of to recap on key governance considerations, uh, Who's, who do we let create teams in Office 365 groups? Uh, if we restrict it, are we, do we have a process for that, uh, for how people will request it? Do we want any naming conventions? Do we allow guest access and external access or federation? 
Uh, you're going to want to look at your meeting settings and policies. Do we need to lock down any applications? Uh, restrict any third party apps or allow certain ones for certain people? Do we need to adjust any of the messaging policies? This is again, those you saw all those settings that were available. And then do we need to set retention policies for our chat and channel messages? And how are we, and then finally, how are we managing the life cycle of our teams? And would we do things like set group or ex expirations? Just a few other best practices around management. So you always want to assign multiple owners to a team and then monitor for orphan teams. So we always say, don't just create a team with one owner, add another owner so that they can help manage that team if that person is out or not available. Use private channels. You can leverage them to reduce the number of teams you need. So now if you've got some group of three people that you want that are within a team already and they need a private conversation to work, you can do that. We do this at Synergy now. We used to not be able to do this. We used to create, a, we had a uh, an internal delivery team where we spun up a channel for every project and we would have our private conversations there. Uh, now with this feature, when we create that, when that team that I mentioned gets automatically created, we create a private internal Synergy channel. Uh, it's locked down to just the Synergy people. And then we can have a collaboration on our deliverables before we present them to the client. So private channels are extremely powerful uh, and they really can, can help you minimize. Um, you also want to minimize the number of teams that someone's a part of. You don't want to just uh, willy-nilly be adding everybody to every team. Teams is meant to be a tool where uh, collaboration is uh, it's useful. It's for projects and things that are, are meaningful to the to the people using them. So that's usually a sign that um, you want to look at the way you're structuring it. You want to avoid having too many teams with the same membership. This is kind of a sign of these, these two bullets kind of go together. You also want to use clear and easy to understand names for your teams and your channels. So you don't want people coming into a team, looking at a channel and being like, there's some cutesy name for it and you can't understand what it's about. It's really meant to be, you want them to be accessible, understandable, and then use channel moderators. So there's a feature for you to be able to, uh, within a channel, uh, uh, someone doesn't have to be an owner with the team, but they can actually manage or, or help moderate the conversation, posting of messages uh, and help manage that channel that way. You also can restrict posting to general to the general channel uh, in Teams. Uh, we do recommend this for org-wide teams, although we we have an org-wide team and we allow this, so that that enables a lot of collaboration and uh, some some fun fun stuff there. Uh, again, Teams is is set up so that the default policies are are pretty much what Microsoft recommends for all organizations. But as you've seen, there are a lot of a uh, lot of policies that you may you may not want set that way. Uh, so again, go through all of these, make sure that you uh, you look at them and um, and build up your teams gradually if it's something that you can do. You don't necessarily want to just spin up a team for every department and shove people at it. That's kind of what happened in some cases with SharePoint, didn't go so well. So teams is meant to be uh, kind of, can be, can be done with organic growth, but again, every organization is different. So a lot of content uh, at this point, do we have any other questions? Yeah, we had one, one more one coming more in coming from your. Yeah, just real quick, do you know off the top of your head, Stephen, what the default retention setting is for um, chat messaging? The default retention, I I don't know that offhand. I think you've got to set that, York, but I'm not sure. I would have yeah, to, I'm trying to decide what I want it set to. I want, I want. So, okay, I'll see if I look that up. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look it up for you. Thanks. That looks okay. like the questions that we had in the chat. Yep. If anyone else has any, we, we do have a couple minutes before the top of the hour. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. Otherwise, yes, yeah, Stephen, that was a ton of great information. Like I said, I'd, I want to download those and review them myself. There's so much in there. Yeah, we'll we'll make this deck available, obviously, to everybody. What do you see as you said, minimize number of teams? You know, a specific user is assigned to. What do you see as just a a generic swag of when that becomes too many? Is there Microsoft guidance on that? It's obviously going to change based on it's gonna, user it's gonna role vary and customer organization. size. Yeah, if you find yourself having to leave a lot of teams or, or ask to be removed, then it's usually a sign. Uh, there's no specific number, Dan, of, of right. you know, once once you're a part, of, you should be a part of 10 teams or 15, whatever. You know, it's 
it's going to vary. There are some organizations that um, we worked with one company where they created all their projects at teams to be public and then everybody could join them individually as opposed to them being private ones that they're added to. So uh, it just depends on the organization. It's usually just a sign though. Right. Cool. Well, that looks like the uh, the end of the questions for us. So you've got our contact information there, Stevens, and our, our GitHub uh, support alias.